The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the third chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 3, we'll be reading there verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 3, beginning there in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of all Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestors, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals." He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O Lord, help us to hear what it is you have for us to hear, that we may do what you call us to do, that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. It was as close to a ritual as anything I had growing up. Most weekends I spent with my dad, and since my dad lived right up the hill from Grandma, and since my cousins David and Brad, who we'd later name Jim Bob, but that's a whole other story for a whole other sermon. Since David and Brad often spent the weekends with Grandma, I would often spend at least Friday night at Grandma's house. Now when we were little, Grandma would give us all a bath in the same water, so it was kind of weird, um, and she'd let us stay up late and watch shows like The Golden Girls. We really thought we were adults, three and four years old, watching The Golden Girls. I didn't get a lot of those jokes until I got older. As we got older, though, we'd stay up late in Granddaddy's old shop, drinking Czech colas, eating Vienna sausages, and listening to the Charlie Gilmore show on 95.5 WTVY. They'd have coon hunting on the radio at 10.30. Ask me about that later. While our Friday night habits changed and evolved, one thing always remained pretty much the same, and that was Saturday morning. We'd wake up, and Grandma would have fried some bacon, already made biscuits, and already have drank a cup of instant coffee, usually right out of the saucer to keep it cool. And then we'd put on clothes and go to town. That's what Grandma always said. Y'all boys, go put on your britches. We got to go to town. Now, going to town meant a lot of things growing up. It always meant going to the grocery store, but sometimes it meant going to the laundromat. Sometimes it meant going by the produce stand, out to Uncle Ray's garden, even though Uncle Ray didn't live any more out in town than he was our real uncle. Going to town could mean we were going to the Goodyear store on Park Avenue to have Grandma's oil changed or to make a payment on the lawnmower she bought there. It could mean we were going to the bank to the drugstore, or swinging through the drive through at Burger King because Grandma would say, Christopher, let's go get one of them Whoppers. It could mean going to the barber shop on the corner of the Westgate Shopping Center where all three of us would have our annual shearing. Regardless of where we were going or what we were going to do, going to town was necessary. Some of y'all know what that means, going to town. 
was necessary for life to have any sense of normalcy. After all, nobody who lived in town got up on Saturday morning and said, I reckon I need to drive out past the paved roads to go buy my groceries. I guess I need to drive out past the city limit sign for a haircut to pay my bills to get... No, no. Everything that happened happened in town. Not in the country. Not, not out in the wilderness. Which is why I think it's a bit odd to find ourselves on this second Sunday of Advent in the opening words of the third chapter of Matthew's Gospel where in those days John the Baptist appeared not downtown, but in the wilderness. The wilderness of Judea proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's a bit odd. I mean, if you want to draw a crowd... If you want to go where the action is, you don't set up shop in the wilderness. No, you stand on a soapbox on the corner of Main and Church Street with a megaphone and signs. You stand on the steps of First Church in the shadow of its steeple with an earshot of its bells. If you're John, if you really want to be where it's all going down, you stand before the columned porticos of the temple. The smell of burnt offerings still hanging in the air. The grand image of God's greatness and power shadowing behind you. That's what you do if you're going to talk about the nearness of God. You stand at the front door of God's house and talk about how close God is. You don't stand in a muddy creek wearing clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around your waist, eating locusts and honey. I mean, think about it for a minute. If I stood up here looking like Chewbacca and, and with my hair uncombed, bits of bugs in my beard, sucking on a honeysuckle for breakfast, would you listen to me? Now, to be fair, I know some of you don't listen even though I have a straight tie and brush my teeth, but still, would you? But there's John, standing out in the wilderness, standing in the creek, looking out of his mind, going on and on about the nearness of the kingdom of heaven, the nearness of God, and the folks are flocking out there to see Him. The people of Jerusalem, Matthew says all Judea were going out to see Him, all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by John in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But surely the kingdom of heaven isn't out there. Surely the kingdom of God isn't out there in the wilderness. Out there where the grass grows thick and wild, where the bugs crawl on the ground, where the snakes slither, where they don't have air conditioning or indoor plumbing. God doesn't come out there. Surely God doesn't arrive in the absence of civilization, right? I mean, if the kingdom of God is coming... If God is going to show up, it's got to be in town where the temple is, where the organization is. And maybe, maybe that's why the Pharisees and the Sadducees come out to John in the first place to say, John, John, won't you come on in town? Come on in town. Take a bath. Come on. Put on some clothes fit for a preacher. Come on into town, John. Maybe they went out to check his papers See if he had the proper permits for assembling such a group of folks outside the city to be sure he had the proper ordination. John, are, are you Reverend John, or do we just call you John? Who are you? Maybe, maybe I like to think the best of some people sometimes. Maybe the Pharisees and Sadducees went out and said, John, it's awful hot out here. We got a little extra room downtown right by the temple. Maybe you could come start talking about repentance down there. We got a lot of folks lined up. Why don't you come down there? I don't know. But I do know that when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he wasn't kind to them. He said, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, is that any way to welcome somebody who's come for baptism? Who in the world would want to come down? Can you imagine it? Just as I am playing softly over as folks are going down into the creek, and all of a sudden John says, You sons of snakes! Why are you coming down here for baptism? 
Who in their right mind would want to respond to such an invitation? But what's interesting here is there's a little word that, 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 that kind of trips us up a little bit. It's a little Greek preposition. I don't talk about that a lot, but I thought this was interesting. My Bible, maybe yours, says the Pharisees and the Sadducees were coming for baptism. A little Greek word, epi. Three little letters, epi. But it can also mean that they were coming against baptism. That here they were, these Pharisees and Sadducees, not coming to be dipped in the water, but coming to stop it. And maybe John knew. He knew these folks weren't coming as supporters, but rather as those who sought to shut him down and shut him up. As those who would have the correct, traditional, downtown religion preserved. The rest of John's words in our text this morning are aimed squarely at these Pharisees and Sadducees. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you God will raise up from these rocks children of Abraham. And even now the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Man. They came to John. Came to see what was going on, believing their heritage, their ancestry, their identity was enough. And how, now here's John usurping their power. Their claim to salvation by proclaiming repentance in the wilderness and baptizing anybody who would come to the water. You see, that's just not how it was done. If you wanted to be in, you had to go through the right channels. You had to come to town, to the temple, or at least to a synagogue approved by the temple. You had to be seen by a professional Someone who had been properly trained in the inherited line of the Levitical priesthood, or at least someone approved by one of those priests. And if you were going to be counted among those in the kingdom of God, you had to qualify to meet the minimum standards, be of a certain lineage, maybe a certain race. You had to have the right confession, the right theology, the correct way of seeing the world and the scriptures, especially according to those who would oversee the whole thing. But John, John's just letting them all come. John's just letting them all come into the water, claiming the kingdom is near in the wilderness for everybody. And what's crazy about that is John's not even the head man in charge. Did you notice that? John doesn't say, this is the kingdom of God and I'm bringing it. He doesn't say that, no. John's out there in the wilderness like the one the prophet Isaiah spoke about. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh, make His paths straight. He's in the wilderness as one who's only making the way ready for the one to come. One who, as he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But the one who's more powerful than I is coming after me and I can't even carry a sandal. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This one is coming after John. Following John. Out there in the wilderness. John's not the opening act, the hype man, for someone who's just going to show up in town the next day. He's not handing out flyers to say, the one who's coming after me, guess what? He's going to show up in the most holy place tomorrow at 6.30. No, no. John in his camel hair underwear, his unkempt hair, his locust legs sticking to his teeth, is saying the one who is coming will follow him in the wilderness. And this one who is coming will be even more powerful, baptizing with fire, a fire of refinement and judgment. But no one, no one really like that would come in the wilderness, right? What if people don't hear? What if they don't show up? I mean, this is the God of the universe we're talking about. The God of the universe would surely not make His presence known in an ankle-deep muddy creek, but in the gold-gilded and marbled halls of the temple, right? 
At the very least, God would, would appear in some grand palaces of power. Perhaps in the pulpits before the unrolled scrolls of Scripture. Surely, God would choose to show up in town where the action is, where the power is, in the unexpected or the expected places of strength and authority among those who choose to be powerful and wield it. Right? That's where God ought to show up. God would never really follow somebody like John. Someone so weird. Someone so radical out in the woods. Right? That's just crazy. That's about as crazy as driving out past the city limits to get your dry cleaning done. As crazy as heading to the outskirts of town to do all your grocery shopping. God showing up in the wilderness after somebody like John. Well, the next thing you know, the next thing you know, they'll say that God, God isn't just going to show up, but, but that God was born as a, a baby. And not some baby in, in the most prestigious maternity wing of the best hospital. They're going to tell you that he was born as a baby and put in a barn in a feed box to some unwed teenage mother in the middle of nowhere. They'll tell you that, that God isn't some old man sitting on a throne in the clouds, long white beard. They'll tell you he was executed as a criminal, lynched after a rigged trial. They'll tell you that God isn't taking names and judging like some kind of cruel game show host. They'll tell you that he's actually taking names and calling us beloved in spite of our sins and failures. Yeah, the first thing these gospel writers will want to tell you is that, that he's going to follow after John outside of town in the wilderness after some baptizing preacher. And then they'll want to tell you that he was born as a baby in a manger. That God is love. That God loves us enough to die to show it. And that God loves all of us. Is it any wonder then, is it any wonder that they want to drag him back into town, to shove him back in the box of the temple, to keep him safely in the syntax of the words on a page, on a scroll? No wonder the Pharisees and Sadducees come out to hush John up. God belongs in town, in the proper understanding, in the proper context, among the proper people, those who already believe the proper and right things about God. I mean, after all, if you listen to the voice in the wilderness, if you get dipped in the muddy creek by a bug-eating Baptist, if you really believe all that stuff about the manger, the shepherds, the magi, the feeding of thousands, the washing of feet, the healing of the sick, the nailing to a cross, about this Jesus of Nazareth being the one who's coming after John, the one with power to baptize with fire. If you believe all that stuff, chances are you may not be so willing to go along with the religious folks in town who want to claim a monopoly on God. See, John came to baptize the world and to baptize for the repentance of sin. But Jesus, Jesus, John said, came to set the whole thing on fire. To refine a religion bogged down with the notion that God was only for those who meet the qualifications. To burn away the chaff of a system that sought to make those on the margins, in the wilderness of existence, invisible and insignificant. Christ came to show us the way that the way of God isn't found in town among the well-to-do and the brightly polished, but out in the wilderness, in muddy creeks, in stables, in fields with young frightened shepherds, in leper-lined streets, the crowded cells of prisons, and the welfare lines, the overflowing homeless shelters. The side of on-ramps in the interstate, the drafty trailer parks, crowded border crossings, that the way of the Lord is always among those we least expect. Always among those we may never expect. The way of the Lord comes like a voice 
calling in the wilderness, calling us to repentance, calling us to come and see, to come and follow the one who baptizes with a fire that burns away every single thing that stands between us and one another. Every single thing that stands between us and God. And on this second Sunday of Advent, my prayer is that we heed the voice in the wilderness as we draw closer to the cradle of Christ, as we draw nearer to the coming of the one whose winnowing fork is in his hand, the one who will clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into the granary, but the chaff, all the stuff we seek to pile on top of it, the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. May we heed the voice in the wilderness that calls us this season at every season of our lives. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, the one who comes after John, baptizing with the Holy Spirit in fire. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to heed that voice that calls us. The voice that comes from unexpected places. The voice, Lord, that may even call us against our expectations of who you are. For, Lord, if this season is about anything, it's about the way you come into our lives and into this world in ways we would never expect, in ways we would never plan. And yet you still do. So even in this time, come in our hearts, Lord, in our minds, in our presence, in ways that we may never expect. Move among us, Holy Spirit. Help us to hear that voice calling in the wilderness. Come and see, to come and follow, to even come and die, Lord, for you and for one another. Be with us, Holy Spirit, we pray now in Christ's name. Amen.